fatal climb. Control V. Okay, so at this point, we're going to go ahead and go live so anybody will be able to see this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give it a few seconds um, to load through Facebook and then check my phone to make sure that we can hear it on the phone. So right there, we are live. And let me just go to Facebook app. Man, I love this. The phone won't let me back out of there. It's just an install. I think that's why it's been lagging. <laughs> I hate that. I hate when my phone does that. Okay, let's postpone that. And we'll score it onto the video and go ahead and say something to the microphone. This is Josh Whitmire. Josh Perfect. We're coming through. Okay. So I'd like to welcome everybody back. Um, today I'm with Josh Whitmire of Disability Rights and Resources. And um, at this point, I'm going to hand it over and let Mr. Whitmire introduce himself. My name is Josh Whitmire, and I'm the uh, peer advocate for uh, Disability Rights and Resources. I cover Jefferson County, and I've been with the agency since uh, October of 2011. Since 2011, mm -hmm. so you've had eight years' experience here uh, at DRR. Yes. Now, DRR is located, this office is in downtown Birmingham, but DRR, uh, Disabilities Rights and Resources, is statewide in Alabama. Not necessarily. Um, we hope to be at some point. Uh, right now, we just have, uh, we have our office that covers the Birmingham, off Birmingham area, and then we have a uh, sister agency that covers the Montgomery area, and then we have a third sister agency that covers the uh, Mobile area. Mobile. But, as, but as far as disability rights and resources coverage area, it's the uh, five-county Metro Birmingham area. Okay. Um, you think the next expansion would be like Huntsville area? That's what we're hoping for. Yeah, because that would be a, the kind of the next step that's there. What, yeah, that's what we're hoping for. Yeah. Um, and so DRR... Uh, has been around for quite a while in Alabama. Yeah, since t since uh, 1980. Since 1980. Mm -hmm. So um, coming up on your 30-year anniversary right. uh, at DRR. And um, if you could give me a little bit of history about how DRR came to be um, in Alabama. Well, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, there's... Uh, you have all these individuals that have disabilities, and they need a, uh, a way... They needed a place to have a voice. Mm -hmm. So... Other other uh, states have enacted uh, centers for independent living, which is what we are classified as, and so we needed one as well because, like I said, Alabamians needed a voice, and especially especially Alabamians with disabilities, they needed a voice too. So since uh, 1980, we've been around and we've been uh, advocating on behalf of uh, individuals that have all types of disabilities, whether it's, you know, visible, uh, visual, hidden, you know, what have you, and then just to get, just to give them a voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of my experiences with my family member, and that's intellectual and developmental disability, um, but disabilities, rights and resources covers all disabilities. Yes, we are a, uh, what they call a cross-disability organization, which means that we cover um, anyone that self-identifies as a person with a disability. Whether, like I said, whether that's uh, individ individuals that are blind, individuals that are deaf, you know, somebody such as myself with a um, uh, spinal cord injury, a physical disability, um, emotional disabilities, it, we cover it all. Yeah. Um, I feel like that's a very good resource and it should be statewide. And I know you guys are working that, mm -hmm. uh, toward that. Is the Birmingham office, um, do you guys serve the biggest population out of people served by DRR? Or would you say the Montgomery office is a little bit bigger? Or? Well, each each center is is a little bit unique, uh, but of course Birmingham, being the core of the state, uh, we do have the majority of the uh, population up here. Okay. Um, and again, like I said, each each center is unique in in uh, how they cover their needs and you know the the individuals that they serve. Uh, but yeah, we do see the majority of the population up here. Now, when you say each center is unique, does that mean that 
uh, some centers would specialize in specific disabilities or uh, how do you mean by that? Not necessarily. Um, each each center has a, a, a list of core services that they provide, mm -hmm. but then the, uh, once they provide those core services that the government says that they uh, need to be able to do, uh, then you can then you can, then that's where you can get a little unique whether whether it's um you know home modification services or um, transition services or you know children's services and things like that. But the, once you cover the uh, basic core services, then you can get uh, a little bit more unique to you know meet the needs of your population. Yeah, I think that's a really cool thing that's allowed the flexibility there. You can't have it too rigid because each right. person's needs are different. Right. Um, so I think that's a really cool thing that each center is allowed to, you know, I understand that you have to cover those, those core services, right. but after that, if you have a specific population in your area or your region that needs these types of things, then you can kind of adapt to that. And and it, and that's exactly what we try to do. And uh, we have a, uh, we like I said, we cover five counties uh, in this area, and we have uh, four four offices that cover five counties. And each one of those offices within within itself is uh, unique because the the communities around those offices they have specific needs and specific populations that they, that they cover. Yeah. So the staff that cover the individual offices, they have their own gifts and they have their own specializations that, that, that make, uh, you know, their communities unique. So, you know, yes, uh, you know, we, we, have, like I said, we have our main stuff that we do, but, um, you know, we try to, we try to cover it all. Yeah. To be able to serve the population right. that, you know, that come to you. So that's very cool. Now, one of the big things um, for disability rights and resources is advocacy. Mm -hmm. And I hear the word advocacy quite often in the community, and I still don't feel like I have a very good understanding of it. So what does advocacy mean to you and to DRR? Well, advocacy to me personally means that um, basically doing what I need to do and learning what I need to learn so that I can have a voice. Because there's a lot of individuals out there that want to take the voice of a person with a disability away from them. Mm. So what we what we as an agency tried to do is we tried to e equip the individuals, whether that's you know through a skill or through um, learning how to speak up, or learning how to ask questions. Basically, we we equip them with the skills so that they can advocate for themselves. Mm. Because if you if you do something for somebody, mm -hmm. you, of course it, it's going to be beneficial. Uh, to an extent, but if you show them how to do something for themselves, it's going to be that much better. Yeah, empowering them. Right, there. right. Yeah. So advocacy then would be uh, self advocacy would be learning the skills to help me voice my needs and interests to to live my full life. Right. And advocacy, like a family advocate, would be helping my family member learn the skills to be able to voice her. Right. I, I hear, so it's focused around communication um, and being able to communicate your needs to, to the community. Well, there's there's a couple of different uh, levels to that. Of course, there's the uh, the basic advocacy, which is the individual advocacy. But then there's another thing that we focus on, which is, you know, systems advocacy, which is basically, you know, understanding the, uh, you know, transportation needs of our communities and trying to figure out uh, how we can make that better mm -hmm. or understanding health care needs so that we can... Uh, better equip, um, you know, the cities and communities that we live in to uh, work with the populations that we serve. So those are two examples of, you know, systems advocacy. Yeah, so that, that's a good thing because when I hear advocacy, I, I think on like the personal or the family mm -hmm. level, but there's definitely a need for the systems advocacy right. um, for people that aren't familiar. Uh, so Because if you don't have systems advocacy, well, then the uh, personal advocacy is going to suffer. Yeah, it's just not going to be heard. Right. Um, so, yeah. Very cool. Um, now, one thing that we talked about a little bit before going live here is the Advocacy and Action Academy. Basically, that is a new program that we have through the uh, DD Council that we, a grant that we got that is basically going to allow us to, essentially, like I was saying earlier, equip individuals to learn the skills and, and you know to essentially speak up for themselves, whether that's, you know, talking to your legislatures or talking to city council members or, you know, learning how to be on a board or just basically just learning what it's going to, learning what is needed to basically figure out what your needs are and figure out how to ask for them and figure out how to 
not necessarily not take no for an answer, but not give up until you get what you need. So that uh, program focuses on the individual advocacy empowerment there. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's going to be uh, in, in more, more so on the individual basis. Now, do you guys already have people enrolled in that uh, program or how is that being rolled out? Uh, that's that's a very new program that we have. Mm-hmm. And so um, that's, that's still in the works. It's still in, in the development stages. But like I said, there are going to be a few uh, you know, sessions uh, leading up to it, which you can uh, you know, which you can check our Facebook page and our um, our website, which is uh, disability rights or drradvocates.org, and we'll have those those posted on that page, um, you know, as far as updates. So, but right now it's 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 still in the development stages. Okay, perfect. So if someone was um, interested in, <clears throat> in learning more about that uh, program that you guys are running out, uh, going to be running out here, um, follow the Facebook Live. I know you guys are very active on Facebook. Um, mm-hmm. right. You know, I saw you guys post quite frequently daily, you know, weekly, stuff like that. Um, so you'll be talking about that program being rolled out through Facebook and through uh, the Disability Rights and Resources, drradvocates.org. Right, right, right. And um, when do you think that, that program will start? <laughs> Well, like I said, um, it's really, I'm not the one that's under that program, Mm -hmm. so I I can't necessarily, I don't want to necessarily say, you know, when things will happen, but I do have a few, uh, I do have a few dates. Mm -hmm. So let's see. So starting in uh, uh, May 23rd of uh, 2019, they'll have an event at the uh, UAB, and then uh, June 28th, they'll have a school, they'll have an event at the Horizons School, mm-hmm. and then uh, July, and they ha- they'll have an event in July. But uh, as far as the uh, specific details, I don't necessarily want to go into that because like I said it, that isn't the program, mm-hmm. and so and I don't want to you know give out information that may not have been created. Yet. But starting in, in uh, May, starting uh, in May, yeah, 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 there'll be some introductory right. uh, gathering stuff like that. Right, perfect. So that'll be coming out soon. Um, <clears throat> one thing I wanted to talk about is. You mentioned that each center has a little bit of freedom um, once they've covered the core services. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to talk about those core services. Um, there are quite a few, and I'd like to just go over them individually okay. um, and have you introduce them and then give an example of someone that would benefit from those services. Uh, I think the community it really relates well with uh, examples. So one of the services is personal assistance. Okay, uh, so that is something that um, we, as an agency, uh, we that would be what they would consider an information and referral service because we did that in the past, and we just don't have the funding to do that right now. But that doesn't mean that there isn't necessarily a need because if you have an individual that, let's say, they're they're a uh, quadriplegic and they're in a power chair and they they need. Uh, help with what they call activities of daily living. Mm-hmm. Well, they're, they're, they're still going to come to us because everybody, a lot of people know disability rights and resources, and they know that you know if, if there's a need that's related to disability, then they're going to come to us. So we're still going to you know help them try to get the information. But as far as uh, personal care services, that's going to be somebody that's going to be able to help you um, you know, you could dress in the morning, you know, cook breakfast, you know, make your meals for you, you know, keep your house clean, you know, and things like that. And sometimes um, if you if you still have a job and that you need to get to, sometimes mm-hmm. they'll, you know, drive your vehicle for you or, you know, things like that. Now, th- that uh, personal care, um, that the funding is not provided through DRR. It's through Medicaid, through uh, ADMH. It's through the... Uh, Medicaid waiver. Medicaid waiver. Yeah. So if somebody was looking for those services, personal care services, they would come to you and you guys would help advocate on their behalf to the state? Uh, yes. To get that waiver yeah, yeah, service? Yeah, we would, or we would have, at the very least, we would point them in the right direction towards, you know, getting, you know, this is who you need to speak with, this is where you would need to go, and these are the questions that you would need to ask. Yeah. Because, because you don't want to just hand somebody a piece of paper and, and just send them on their way. Otherwise, you know, they're still not going to benefit. Yeah. So, so you want to, you know, prepare them and give and you know, equip them with the information that they, that they need so that they can ultimately get the services that they need. I feel like that happens a lot where um, people say, I, I need help in this, but just are unfamiliar about how to go about it or 
or right. the framework of getting it, uh, the documents they need, that kind of stuff. Hmm. Um, so you guys would really help, you know, if, if I were to call and say, hey, I have some questions about uh, personal care services, um, I could come in here and just explain what I'm thinking and you would help me walk me through that process. Right. And But, but I, what I will say is, you know, a lot of people come come to us thinking that we have all the answers. Mm. We, we we certainly do not. We're we're human beings as well uh, that that are that are learning this too because you know guidelines change, regulations they change, change. <laughs> so so it, it changes constantly. So we have to stay in the loop too. Mm-hmm. So um, if you're if you're wanting you know somebody with all the answers, you know that may not we're not we may not necessarily be the right spot for you. But if you want somebody that's going to be willing to sit down with you and talk to you and really try to invest some time in trying to get you uh, where you need to be, mm-hmm. whether that's with us or somebody else, you know, then this is where you need to be. Then awesome. It, it, we're, we're who you need to talk to. Yeah. Now, do, uh, do you come down here? Do you, um, would a person come down here or does somebody travel out to their location? Uh, we could do either one. Uh, you know, it's... It, it's really a case by case basis. Mm-hmm. If they have the ability to travel, then I would I would I would prefer them come down to our office. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, at the same time, you know, if it's easier for me to meet them somewhere, well, then I'm more than happy to do that. Okay, I think that's a really cool thing because then you can kind of see if um, you know what they're talking about in their home. If mm-hmm. they need something there, uh, you can kind of feel it there. Right. And then, uh, and then you you hit the nail on the head. It's just a matter of uh, you know you, you get to see from their perspective what their challenges are and then and then you know you might be able to help them with something else but then if you if you notice a challenge or something else that they that that they didn't necessarily address well then you can address that too yeah because they might be thinking this is my immediate need and you might be thinking well i've seen other things like this you're probably going to run into this here right 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 the next one so let's start working on that as well well yeah that we and we all we call that pandora's box (laughs) yeah And, and, and that gets opened a lot yeah so, because I mean, like I said, you know, there's sometimes you come in with an immediate need, which is, which is, you know, you know, what that's fine. But then there's so many other needs that need to be addressed too. So yeah. we try to do as much as we can. Yeah. It's, um, it's kind of like when you can't take it anymore, then you need an immediate solution. Right. But there's a little, there's steps that got to there. Right. Um, right. That you don't want it to build back up to that place. So let's take care of the steps as well. Right. Right. Um, so. <clears throat> One of the other services um, that I think is a big thing too is housing. Mm-hmm. There is a uh, a push right now through the home and community based services uh, in developmental disabilities for you know we've come a long way from the institutions. Um, they, we shut down all the institutions in uh, in Alabama, and then <clears throat> now we have some larger group homes and what have you, but there's a really big push for, um, individuals to live in the community. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think one barrier to that is affordable housing. I really do. Right. Um, so what does the housing service offered through DRR look like? It's really, um, it's more of an information and referral uh, service as well, because we as an agency, and this is this has always been like this, is we as an agency don't kind of don't control any housing. Uh, we never have and we never will, mm-hmm. just because you know our agency is based on built on consumer control, and if we're controlling housing, well then that's not that's that falls in the face of consumer control. Mm-hmm. So what we do is we partner with uh, different agencies, different organizations. That um, that do provide uh, you know low income housing, whether that be private organizations or you know housing authorities or you know individuals or organizations that have um, that control housing that uh, statewide housing databases, you know you know we'll we'll take any information that we can and we um, because like like you said the the, the need is great yeah. and the availability is you know it's limited yeah. And even if you can find a spot, you have to make sure it works financially. Right. Um, so what would be is Section 8? Is that a possibility? or is So I'm trying to go through what some of those organizations or private, um, you know, things might be. Well, I mean, if you, if you have a Section 8 voucher, well, then um, you can do it, uh, you know, a couple, of different, a couple of different ways. You can go through housing authority. But then, you know, with that, you're looking at uh, at least at the very minimum a six-month waiting list. Oh really? Uh, six month to you know probably two years, so so there's that. But then there's also uh, private organi- uh, private uh, 
housing complexes that that will accept housing vouchers as well. So we try to you know push towards that. Uh, that way we don't have an individual that's waiting for two years when they could be looking at other options and get you know get into something within you know a month, a month, a month or two. Now what, you mentioned housing voucher. I'm unfamiliar with that. What is that? That's basically just a uh, program that, they, that you can get through the uh, housing authority. And it's just a, um, it's just something that allows you to uh, get into a uh, get into a housing situation where it's uh, and it's allow it allows it to be you know based on the income that you have, which is thirty percent of of whatever your income you have. That's going to be what your uh, base rent is going to be. So, so um, if I'm an individual and I I need a housing and. Uh, now, when you say income, what if I'm not working? Is that also thirty percent of my social security? Yeah, I mean it's 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 whatever income you know, whether that's SSI, SSDI, or if you're working, or if you're working part time, full time, you know, it's 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 income, whatever that income is. How do you qualify for a voucher? You would just need to uh, contact the housing authority, and then they they can uh, help you determine you know what the criteria is. Um, and what's the organization in that? You said Housing Authority? Yeah, it's the uh, Housing Authority of the Birmingham District. Housing Authority, Birmingham District. Now, mm-hmm. is there a, like a waiting list for that as well? Or there, Well, they have multiple programs. Uh, their, their public housing program is there's a substantial waiting list for that. Mm-hmm. But then their Section 8 program, you know, it, you know, it varies based on uh, the, the, the individual site. Okay. On, uh, on availability. I feel like that's a huge thing. And I, I've s- heard questions about housing before, and I didn't know that that housing voucher existed. Mm-hmm. So if you qualify for a housing voucher, and it may be some time until there's a right fit in the living environment and paperwork goes through and everything, but it would say <clears throat> you're certified that your rent won't be more than 30% of your income. Right. Now, does the private housing and the government, they accept that? And the housing authority, they make the difference in what the um, standard? Well, well there's, there's subsidies that, okay. that, that make up the difference. Gotcha. So, but okay. you, you, just don't want, you just don't want to put all of that on the individual. Yeah. So there's subsidies in place to make up the difference. Okay. All right. I got gotcha. you. Um, yeah, I think the housing authority is a really cool thing. I didn't know about that fact. That's huge. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, I've I've been very fortunate in in the fact that you know I do have a full time job, so I am able to uh, you know make ends meet and then live in a what they call a fair market unit. Or, uh, I've lived in fair market apartments, you know, since, ever since two thousand seven. So, and those are you know th- those can get very expensive. Yeah. So if you um, if you and you have to be able to be able to afford it, and if you can't afford it, then what well, you still have to have a roof over your head. Yeah. So yeah, and you know the the, the federal government's really pushing the independent living in the community, and that's right. you know. So I feel like the housing authority is going to be getting a lot of calls over the next few years. Right. Um, so. But nope. yeah, and, but they've uh, they've been great in uh, in uh, in trying to address the need and try to be you know a lot more creative with you know with how they do what they do. So uh, I do give them a lot of credit. Yeah, very cool. Um, <coughs> I would like to talk about um, another service is home modification. Mm-hmm. If you could explain a little bit about that. Well, with our agency, there we have uh, two programs. Uh, we have one program through the city of Birmingham that is, that allows for you know either a ramp to be put on a home, or uh, if you don't if you don't necessarily need a ramp, then you can get uh, maybe a side of handrails uh, on a set of stairs, or you know low rise stairs. Oh, what about chair lifts? Yeah, yeah, they, they, upstairs and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, there's there is uh, there's a component for that too if there's a need because uh, as we all know Birmingham is not flat. Um there's there's lots of hills and you know some Vulcans, of them are a lot steeper. Vulcans look down on us from top of the yeah, hill. Yeah, <laughs> so they, so it's, it's not exactly a flat area. So and sometimes, you know, the the terrain of your property may not warrant a ramp. So you know, so then, you know, you would be assessed for a stair tear, whether that's, you know, going into a garage or, you know, what have you. But then, um, 
But that is definitely done on a case by case basis. Case by case, because like I said, there's there's no uh, there's no one size fits all for that. Yeah. Now, who does that? The home modification you said Birmingham helps out with that a lot. Is there a specific organization that? Um, where does the funding for that come from? It comes from, it comes from, from the city. From the city. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're required to basically modify a home if it's deemed necessary. Well, it the what it is, and like, and I'm, again, I'm not over that program, mm-hmm. so I don't, I don't want to go into specifics. Uh, but uh, how it basically would work is an individual, uh, a lo- an individual that meets, uh, you know, the income requirements would give us a call, and then they would say, well, this is what I need, whether it be a ramp or you know, you know, bathroom modifications, you know, what have you. And then uh, they would talk to our uh, home modification coordinator, mm-hmm. and then he would discuss um, eligibility and you know criteria and things like that. And then he would go do a home visit, mm-hmm. and then uh, physically you know do take measurements and do um, you know basically a home site. Yeah, and just determine okay, well a ramp would work would work, but it would be too expensive, mm-hmm. or so then you would go through this. Uh, go through the stitch here. So, or if you need um, a bathroom modification, you know this might work, but this won't work. And so there's so the, the home visit is crucial in determining. Yeah, you have to uh, see it in the home environment. Yeah. You know, you can it, sketch it out on a piece of paper, but until you get in there and actually feel it, yeah, yeah, th- that that part of it is crucial. Yeah. So, but then, um, so so we have a like I said, we have two programs. The first one is through the city of Birmingham, and it's um, de- dedicated dedicated funding from the city. And then we have another program uh, that is that covers the entire uh, five county area. Okay, but it it is uh, it utilizes volunteers. So we have funding for materials, but but then um, you know Chris, our uh, home modification coordinator, would have to have a volunteer group that was available. You know within that area to uh, go uh, fulfill that obligation. Yeah, or like a construction company that wanted to do some uh, volunteering on the yeah. weekend and, and you yeah. know maybe provide some of their services, stuff like that. Right. But yeah, like I said, it's uh, it's 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 it would have to be volunteer based. Yeah, because we just don't that, with that specific program, we just don't have the funding to pay labor. Well, I think that strengthens a community too yeah. because you know it just I think that's a good thing all around if you can find the right people uh, to do that. Uh, I think that strengthens because I, I think uh, I mean everybody in, inherently wants the ability to help somebody else. So in, in, so if you if you can uh, you know put an individual that wants to help together with an with an individual that has a need, I think there's there's going to be a bond that's going to be able to build there. Yeah, and you didn't even know it's the next street over. Yeah, yeah, you, you yeah. Know? So that's that's a cool thing. <clears throat> okay, um, another one of the services uh, listed. Um, is peer support. Mm-hmm. I hear peer support quite often as well and the benefits that it could have um, and uh, trying to grow that grass grassroots. But mm-hmm. what does peer support mean through DRR? Basically, uh, it is, um, there's two ways of looking at it. Uh, you, you can have individual peer support, which is which is a lot of what I do. And then uh, you can have, uh, you know, group peer support where you have individuals of you know of you know with varying backgrounds and needs and challenges all all kind of sort of bouncing at is off of, off of each other that way you know if if somebody else has you know conquered uh, a need but then they can they can they can get that advice on this this is how i did this and then this individual can say well maybe i should try that for me or you know myself you know i've, I've talked with individuals that are um that are uh, new to, new to the uh, disability world, mm-hmm. and um, you know I, I was there at one point, and so I, I and so I, I you know from a one on one perspective, you know it, it's good to uh, kind of sort of take that experience that that I've gone through and help an individual that is new to this and kind of sort of let them let them know that you know yes things have changed you know and yes things are a whole, whole lot different. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's over. Mm-hmm. So, so just that, that that idea of you know keeping people positive in the light of you know some potentially major changes in their life, you know you want to you want to keep that going. Yeah. Now, what does that communication look like? Is it more of a meeting with in like a physical being with somebody, or more telephone? 
um, talking or what is it? What would that look like for peer support? I, for me personally, I, I find it better if I do it in person. Yeah. Because you can do a lot over Skype or uh, over, um, you know, or video chat or what have you. But I, t- I typically, you know, have a better, you know, response if I'm doing it in person. Yeah. That way you can you can gauge body language and you can really you can really get to know know somebody because you can only get to know somebody so much over a, over a video phone yeah over even a phone call or yeah, something yeah, like that you yeah. can just miss a lot of communication there so but i mean but like i said we you know it has to start somewhere so if somebody calls me and they and they and they're you know they want they have all these questions well well then I'm, I'm doing peer support, peer support on the phone already, just about having a conversation. Yeah. But you know, to pursue that further, you know, then you know, we find a time to meet in person and then go where needs. Now, how many people would you say um, w- are involved in individual peer support? Um, I'll say monthly through DRR. It it really changes. It it varies uh, just because we have. Uh, we have different groups, and we have groups here. We have groups in uh, Blount County. We have groups in uh, uh, Shelby County and Jet and Walker County. So we, we have we have different groups. So I and, and we have a lot of uh, you know individual uh, things that go on. So it you know it it, it varies, and I, I don't necessarily want to put a you know a specific, a specific number on number. that because again I honestly don't know. Yeah, how many would you say are um, some new? Uh, individuals per month that are looking for peer support though would that be a, a, lo- a little easier number probably I, I mean i get calls you know day in and day out so probably i probably get you know five or six calls a day oh wow uh, these are new individuals yeah yeah and they're just they're just new individuals that are that are just trying to uh kind of sort of get a sense on uh okay this is my situation this these are my needs you know, can you help me out? Yeah. I mean, yeah. right there, you're, you're like 150 new individuals um, in peer support a month. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's quite a bit of work. So, so, I mean, it's, um, time. so it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot, it's a lot, it's, there's a lot invested in there. Yeah. So, yeah. It can be challenging. Yeah. It's saying yes too many times we were talking about that earlier. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. Get yourself yeah. in a, a little bit of a hole there. Um, I think the peer support is now you, you mentioned there's the individual and then the group and the group would be where, um, you know, a group of people come together and kind of, I don't know if this is the right analogy, but I think of like an IEP plan mm-hmm. in, in, in school where it's like, um, the group coming together and helping, you, you know, guide mm-hmm. a little bit there. Right. So is it more of the, the, the support, would it be start off as a group and then go individual? It, it 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 can it can it can go either way. It could either be individual or go as a group, or you know vice versa. Uh, but you know, one thing that I that I try very hard not to do is you know if I'm you know, quote, you know facilitating a group, I don't necessarily want to be considered the the leader of the group because mm-hmm. I'm not leading the group. The group is in charge of the group. So, you know, the whole, the whole idea of it is to have, you know, each other, you know, be, be able to speak to each other and, you know, just bounce ideas off of each other. So, and, I, and I'm, I'm just there, you know, making sure that, you know, things are proceeding smoothly yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. I think that's a big thing. We do that with the annual plan for my family member. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very important that she is running the meeting even right. though she's nonverbal you know it's she's that's why we're there is for yeah her. And, and then uh you you hit a good point as far back to ips uh you know the uh the student-led iep mm-hmm. you know there, there's nowhere near enough of that uh where they have the uh the students that are actually leading their meetings it's, it's typically the uh parents the, or the, the parents of the teachers or the uh the administrators within the school system that are, that are telling the indiv- the child what their needs are instead of the child telling everybody else what their needs are. Mm-hmm. So you know, to me, that's backwards. It's a hundred percent backwards. So, yeah. but uh, we're but we're actively trying to change that. Yeah. So you work with the education system. Um, I want to be sure that I don't get those two confused. Do you are you involved in IEPs? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, all of the staff that do uh, that that are in the. Uh, Peer advocacy role uh, they do uh, w- within uh, 
within their abilities. Uh, you know, they'll they'll get into the school system and they'll attend IPs and you know other ad, other uh, educational advocacy related matters. Yeah, I think that would be really cool to have um, like to go into an IEP and be able to say, you know, no, we're here for. This right, person, right, you guys right. need to calm down. This is their life. Right. Um, let let him or her speak. Right. Right. And so, like I said, that's uh, that's that's a fight that's ongoing, mm-hmm. and it, it's going to be ongoing for a while. Because, but it's it's as long as we're continually chipping away at it, you know, we're making progress. Now, what kind of fight back do you get there? Just like here, I say, like the admins and teachers saying, "Well, we can't do that. We don't have the resources." Yeah, exactly. Because I mean, you you had a lot of. Um, you know, with, with a lot of our part, a lot of our area, it's it's very rural. Mm-hmm. So you know, in rural, mean typically means there's not enough funding. Which, and you know, if you have an individual say that needs um, uh, any kind of assistive technology devices or things like that, well, then if you don't have the funding, well, then you know you're gonna have to you know you're gonna have a harder time getting the individual the the, um, the, the equipment that they need. Yeah. The- or if there's a, accommodations that they might need, not necessarily equipment, just accommodations. If you don't have the um, staff that you know really understand the system and how and how that that part of it works, well, then you know we would come in and not necessarily you know strong arm the. Uh, administration because we, we we certainly don't you want to have a good relationship yeah you don't want to come out of a win-win for everybody's yeah okay. yeah you, you don't want to come out guns blazing yeah <laughs> because that, that, that's 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 not gonna be good for anybody mm-hmm. so you know, it, it's, you just want to make sure that like you said the 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 end the student is while we're here so making sure that the student's needs are met is it, that's the ultimate goal and you mm-hmm. want to do that as as respectfully but as you know completely as possible um someone had a, a question like an interpreter Mm-hmm. Um, so that would be an example of something. Right, like right, yeah, yeah. If you have an, if, if if you have a student that is uh, that has a hearing impairment, and uh, yeah, they they need to be able to uh, fully participate. Yeah. And, and if you want, if you if you need an interpreter to fully participate, the school system needs to provide that. Yeah. And that can be tough. You almost have to walk the school system. You take their hand and walk them through that. Like, mm-hmm. no, you guys, we're doing this. Kinda. Well, I mean, I, I've I've been in school systems where you know, you know, it's been very good, and they've been very, very, you know, very, very, you know, welcoming and you know, willing to do things. And then I've been I've been in school systems where you know it's been a little bit more of a challenge. Mm-hmm. So you know, it, it varies, and you know, and you and, and you're gonna have that with the with the variety of uh, you know urban environments and rural environments. You know, you're you're you're, just, you're gonna have that. Yeah. Yeah, so it's an individual case just with the schools as well. Right, right. You know, so. <clears throat> okay, so we did, uh, we kind of hit on peer support and then took a left-hand turn into right. IEPs right. and okay. education, which is always good. I right. love when we make left-hand turns. <clears throat> Another one of the services that I wanted to talk about are transitional subsidies. I do not know what that is. Well, it's not necessarily about, you know, transitional subsidies it's just that the, the the idea of transition is an is it's actually a new core service that we that uh, centers for independent living are uh, man, mandated to provide and there's there's a couple of different avenues to look at that you know because you know somebody uh you know our age you'll be transitioning from you know either you know high school or college or you know you know trade school or whatever and then you're trying to get get you're trying to get your first apartment trying to you know get out on your own things like that but then there's on on the uh flip side of that there there is the idea of living in an institution and then and not wanting to live in an institution yeah and getting back to community-based living so you're saying that um, you know one example would be transitioning from like say you're say you're in a nursing home. Okay. And say so you're in a nursing home and you don't want to be there. Yeah. Because the services that you're getting are inadequate. Mm-hmm. Uh, the treatment that you're getting is inadequate, and you want to be in your in your own home. Mm-hmm. Well, then we 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 would uh, you know definitely work with you one on one to determine okay uh, what what are your needs you know and then how can we best fulfill the obligations of trying to make sure that your that your needs are met within the community whether that's you know uh, finding some finding supports or you know building ramps or you know making something more accessible you know what have you but then back to the the other part of transition 
a lot of individuals that we uh, work with that are that are coming out of the school system they are um, they're going to be totally new to the idea of living on your own, making your own decisions, yeah. you know, thinking for yourself. Those are two different scenarios. Yeah, there. yeah. mentally, you know, two yeah. different scenarios. Two totally different scenarios. And so, and, and, and stuff that you need to be prepared for as much as possible. Yeah. When I was that age, I wasn't prepared for it, and I, and it, and I paid the price for it. Um, but, you know, you want to... Uh, I paid by her. <laughs> yeah, 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 we... It shocked for me. Too. Yeah, we all did. Um, that first bounce check was a nightmare. <laughs> My so, phone's going off. You cannot make that purchase. <laughs> so, yeah, but uh, but the idea of, okay, you're on your own. You're, you're on your own now. You got to pay You got to pay rent. You got to pay bills. Um, you got to make sure that uh, you're not, you know, doing this or that. You know, you, you've got to, you've got to be able to understand all that. But then if you're, if you're a person with a disability and you're living on your own, then you've got to understand, you know, if you say, for example, you're moving into an apartment, understanding, you know, reasonable accommodations, Mm -hmm. you know, whether that's, you know, getting a curb cut so that you can get on from the the street to to the curb Mm -hmm. or having an accessible parking space put in or having appliances put in that you can actually use without burning your arms. Yeah. Um, you know, those are those are all personal experiences that I've had to do with, in in the uh, five apartments that I've had. Mm-hmm. So, I feel like I went to a, um, a meeting the other day, and they had a couple of figures up on the on the PowerPoint. And nationally, it, it was Medicaid funded, uh, where the Medicaid funding is going. And in Alabama, we had about seventy four percent in living in provider homes. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a big push to be in on you know kind of in your own place. Right. Right. Um, I feel like that transitional. A lot of people could take uh, advantage of DRR's um, transition subsidies there, or the transitional, um, and maybe transitioning from the provider home to their own right. living. Because it, uh, living on your own is so much less expensive mm-hmm. uh, than living in an institution. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know what the exact figures are, but it's, it, it is staggering. So, um, yes, there are certain supports that may or may not be needed, and we can certainly assist you in uh, trying to get you know get those supports in place. And it's certainly support that's you know that is out there. Mm-hmm. So, so you so you don't necessarily have to live in an institution. You you can certainly live on your own. And again, it's a case by case basis. But we, but that's where we would come into play is you know helping you figure out you know. This is what this is what you say your needs are. Well, these are the organizations that help. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, it was it was the figure I think seventy four in Alabama through providers, and nationally it was something like thirty yeah. percent. So we want to get down to that, right. you know, thirty percent. So I feel like there's a lot of opportunity right. uh, in that program for people and for the organizations. Right, here. right, right. And you still want to make sure that. You know, as you're cutting down the 74, you don't want to funnel back into there. So you do want to focus on the transition out of the education system to their own community living. So you, have, you can kind of skip that. Right. And, uh, and you want to, uh, and you it goes back to the uh, making sure that they're prepared so that they can, once, so once they're in their own, uh, in their own environment, they stay in their own environment so that they don't, you know, go back and forth. So they, so they, so they could have more of a you know, stable living situation. Now the transition, do, there are, I feel like there's a few transitions earlier um, in life in the education system, like into the school system. Mm-hmm. Do you guys also do some of that or do you focus more on kind of the later? Well, it's, um, it really just depends uh, on, on the kind of call that we get uh, based on the need. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes we, we've gotten a lot of calls for individuals uh, that have children that are, you know, two, three, four years old, and they're uh, they're trying to get into the early intervention programs. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're trying to, uh, you know, equip them with, okay, these are these are the needs. These are the organizations that are, that are out there that can start working with your child early on, even though they're not, they may not necessarily be, be of the age of, you know, pre-K or elementary school. You can, you can still get those sources. Mm-hmm. So, um it hasn't happened a lot, yeah. but we do get a lot of uh, individuals uh, that have children, uh, you know, that age. And then, of course, there's, you know, needs of individuals that are, you know, middle school, high school, you know. So it, it really ranges uh, anything from, uh, you know, kindergarten earlier to you know college. All the way through. And even yeah. if you're living in an institutional setting at 
50, like, mm-hmm. you know, you want to get your own place. That would be. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. Like, like I was just talking about the, the, the educational part of it, but yeah, yeah. no, it looks like I said, if you're, uh, we, if you're in an institution, we've, we've had individuals that have been, you know, as young as, you know, 16, but, and yet, and yet they were in a nursing home. There's, there's no reason for that. Yeah. So, so we, we would, we would, we worked with the individual to get them out and get them placed in a, in, in another, in a, in a, more suitable environment mm-hmm. in, in the community and then uh but like i said it's it ranges anywhere from 16 to you know 99 now when <clears throat> i kind of want to focus on the transition maybe like from high school to independent living in the community okay what year in high school or what age would you start or would you see most people call and start asking questions about typically it's uh they're starting when they're you know, seniors because they're about to graduate mm-hmm. and they're, and they're kind of freaking out because <laughs> they're like, okay, my kid's about to graduate and I don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. So, uh, then we, we it, it's kind of sort of, you got to work pretty quick because you know, the, the, cl- the clock is ticking, um, especially if they're uh, about to be 21 and they're about to be, they're about to age out of the program Yeah, because once you're 21, you, you, you're done with school, whether yeah. you graduate or not, you're done. Yep. Um, so, but typically the uh, transition process starts about 15, 16. Okay. We would love for it to start earlier because there's, there's no, you, you can, you can never, you know, start that early enough as yeah. far as the planning. Mm-hmm. So, but, but officially it starts at 16. Okay. So don't wait. If uh, when you see this, do not wait until your last month of senior year. Yeah, yeah. Don't. <laughs> Otherwise, you're gonna make more gray hair for me. <laughs> so. Um, one of the other services that I think is a big one and kind of goes along with the transition that we were talking about there, living independently in the communities, is um, independent living skills. Mm-hmm. If you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and that is a big part of what I do specifically. And those, I mean, those can range anywhere from, uh, you know, learning how to uh, balance a checkbook to learning how to pay bills to learning how to make a sandwich, learning how to cook, um, learning how to navigate a home. Um, So it really just uh, depends on what the individual's needs are, Um, especially if... um, (coughs) <coughs> say for example you have somebody that is um newly disabled and they're in the hospital and one day they were a um what that what i'm going to call a perfectly normal uh adult and you know they could walk you know whatever and now they had they now they're in a uh, situation where they're quadriplegic so now you've got to um basically reinvent the wheel yeah so to speak mm-hmm. so uh independent living skills would be huge in that regard um yeah. learning how to you know navigate learning how to you know run a power chair learning how to uh you know learning about accessibility needs learning about personal care services learning about you know, you know lots of different things mm-hmm. so not every situation is no anywhere near that advanced a lot of them aren't thank god because you know yes those situations arise um, and, and there's there's definitely a place for those, but you know a lot of it is more or less just you know learning how to manage my own money and learn learning how to pay my own bills and learning how to have you know money still learning how to still have money at the end of the month. So that's that's the majority of what I do. Yeah, you have to make sure that um, you can still balance that checkbook. Mm-hmm. That's that'll run out on you if you don't keep a close eye on it. Uh, let me reload the page it froze up on me for a second. And then let me get a key one. Um, just one second. Okay. Uh, I, I do want to dig a little bit deeper into independent living okay. cells, but I want to make sure the stream's coming through. Uh, okay. Reload page. Uh, hold on with me, guys. If we are live right now, just... Okay, it looks like we are still good to go. Okay. Um, so we talked a little bit about the independent. Uh, talked some about the independent living skills, um, and you know if there are changes in lifestyle, going through what you know, navigating that mm-hmm. that that 
kind of world there. Um, would you say that most of people you spend time with, um, it was kind of a, I don't know the, the right wordage for this, but it was like a, uh, an accident or if it was more transitional? It, I would say it's it's a little bit of it's some of both um, because like I said I've, I've I've had individuals that have had you know car accidents and that now their you know life situation has changed and now they have to basically relearn how to how to live but then I've also had individuals that have had you know lifelong dis, uh, challenges and disabilities and they just they're trying to learn you know better ways of doing things mm-hmm. because you know what what they ha- have tried to work what they tried to do in the past it's it's worked but you know it's it hasn't worked as well yeah so you try to you try to learn you know better skills Mm -hmm. you know or different ways of doing things well and there's always new stuff coming out right right it's like you know sometimes there's new um laws or sometimes there's new programs or sometimes there's new technology or and it's just kind of keeping in the loop with that yeah, um, yeah, and it, and yeah, it, especially with technology. You no, know, if, if say for example, if you have a uh, a uh, communication need, whether it's you know your uh, individual is you know nonverbal, or you just um, you just don't communicate well, you know, then there's uh, you know programs out there with uh, iPad or you know communication devices that you can um, you know that you can get that mm-hmm. you can learn how to use. So there's 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 lots of different um, things you know to IO skills. Uh, but it really just, like I said, it's just, it's a case by case basis. Um, my family member has a tech talk. Mm-hmm. She absolutely hates it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but that's something that we do train on and, um, uh, you know, we've been training on it for a few years, but that's, um, I don't know if we'll, if there's an upgraded version of that. I should look into that. Mm-hmm. But, 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 but to, to that, you want to have something that the individual will want to use. Yeah. Otherwise nobody's going to benefit. Yeah. So. But yeah, so it make, making sure that the individual is comfortable with 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 whatever they you know is is chosen, you know, is is going to be beneficial for everybody. She likes it when she wants something that she really wants, like yeah. coffee. Yeah. yeah, if it's coffee, yeah, give me a tech talk. I want coffee. Yeah, Let's yeah, go. yeah, yeah. You know, but it, when it's like um, some of the stuff, I think feels mundane to her, mm. and she's like, "No, nah, I don't want to do that right now." Yeah. Um, so, was well, there anything there in independent living skills that? Maybe we haven't talked about. I would say <clears throat> I would want to hit on the uh, the job readiness uh, skills yeah. because um, you know being a person with a disability doesn't necessarily mean that you can't work, mm-hmm. or it doesn't mean that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't want to work. But you know, sometimes you you may need you know certain skills. Um, so, and whether that's, you know, interpersonal skills, learning how to, learn, learning how to communicate, learning how to, um, learning how to write a resume or learn how to, um, learning how to dress or learning how to, you know, whatever, just function in a, uh, in a, uh, in the work environment, in, in the work environment. Yeah. You know, we do, we do a lot of that as well. Okay. Um, I, I am, uh looking to have some help with what we're doing here. Mm-hmm. Um, so if there's anybody you can think of, I could use some help with like all the equipment set up, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe we could talk more about that Okay. after. Um, and another thing that uh, I wanted to talk about was the employment network. And okay. that kind of, you touched on it there, but um, this was a program that was highlighted on the website. Right. Well, that is a program through Social Security the Social Security Administration that we have, it's through um, it, they call it the uh, the Ticket to Work program, uh, but we we but it's through an employment network, which is which is what we are, uh, and then there's there's multiple employment networks throughout the uh, Birmingham area and throughout the state. So, uh, but I do have some talking points on that. So just because I want to make sure that I do get it get it correct. Yes, sir. Um, so. Basically, that just basically, um, the employment network is for individuals that are on uh, SSI and SSEI. Okay. You know, you, you can't just want to come in and say, I want to be part of the network. You have to meet certain criteria. Um, so, and then you have to, let's see, you have to understand um, that, you know, the idea of, 
the benefits part of it, you know, and working and then having benefits and then understanding those the relation of you know, working so many hours and, you know, what that's going to do to your benefits mm-hmm. and just understanding understanding that component of it. I feel like that's a very calculated thing and I think is a fear for a lot of people. Yes, it, it is because I get, I get calls day in and day out of I want to work and I need something to do, but I don't want to lose my benefits. Yeah. Because, and, and it's that, and it, that fear, I don't know where that fear came from. But, well, it's something that I feel like you have and is secure and you rely on that. If that's your only source of income and something were to happen to that, you're right. It would be different. Right. Your daily life would be different. Right. But it, but it, it, it is definitely a mindset change if, if you want to, if you do want to go to work. But, you know, that said, you know, if you, if you're working, if you work within this program, you there provided you meet certain criteria, you know, you can still work and then still receive benefits. Mm-hmm. So, so it, again, it's, it, you know, you have to, uh, you know, call us to determine, you know, if you're, you know, 100% eligible for the program or not. Uh, but, what makes it unique is, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily take away your benefits, but yet you're still able to work. You're still able to um, contribute to society. And even if um, if someone went through and found out that they were qualified and, and went through the process of finding employment, um, you know, you would hope that they went for the employment, but it doesn't hurt just to come in and learn more. <laughs> right. So there's no fear. You don't have to take the job. No. Uh, no. But you can learn more. So, sometimes it's... um. Like for example, for me, interviewing is terrifying. Um, well, I'm, I think I love this time right now. Yeah. So it was, uh, uh, being on camera, being being my like be, all this is uh, yeah, this is intimidating to me. So you know, th- but the more that you can practice this, the the more the better off you're going to be. Mm-hmm. So yes, you may not necessarily get a job, but you know, if you can practice interviewing, the more you practice something, the better you're gonna, you're going to be. Mm-hmm. The more the more the uh, more uh, that you can highlight the, the skills that you have versus the um, you know the skills that you lack you know the, the more presentable you're going to be towards uh, a uh, potential employer mm-hmm. so we, we try to work towards you know highlighting those you know the, the positive parts of it now that said I, I do want to hit on this I do want to say something about you know what we are not as far as an employment network we're not an organization. We're not an organization that's going to basically come in. You're, you're going to come in, and we're just going to hand you a job. Mm-hmm. That's that's not how this is going to work. Mm-hmm. Because that we are we are still we still try to follow the independent living philosophy, which basically means it's consumer control. Which means you know you go out and you get the job and you talk to employers and you're doing all the legwork. We're supporting you mm-hmm. by all means. We, we definitely can support you, but we're not going to do it for you. Yeah. Now, would you accompany somebody? It, it really depends on what the case uh, is. It's a case-by-case basis, but uh, I have done that in the past. Yeah. But you do encourage um, the, the individual to really get you know, get out there on their own. Yeah. Well, and we, we, and we, we definitely try to, to prepare them on, uh, okay, this is what you can say. This is what I wouldn't say. <laughs> and, and, Don't say this yeah, to you. <laughs> yeah, it, it, or, you may be able to say this, but you might want to say it, th- you know, this way, yeah. you know, so it's really just, uh, you know, coaching and preparing individuals that are may not necessarily be, you know, the most comfortable in, in an interview setting. And then you're really just trying to make sure that they're not going to, you know, put their foot in their mouth and say something that's ultimately may may end up costing them the job. Well, it's the old dreaded question in a job interview. What's what's your um, what's your flaw? You right, know, they right. ask you that right. kind of. So you gotta you gotta word that a little bit. Right, right. Yeah, you you, you do want to be you don't you do want to provide an honest answer, but you always want a, a positive spin on it. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, kind of walking through that. I've done that before. And it's like, what am I gonna say? And you yeah. know it's coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think one fear that some people might have is if they were to attain employment and maybe some of their benefits went down because they were receiving um, income through their job, Mm -hmm. what were to happen uh, this, you know, if all of a sudden they weren't able to work that job anymore and there, it takes a little bit of time for the the paperwork to go through and, 
you know, all that stuff. And so there might be a little bit of lapse or a decrease in mm -hmm. their financial situation. Well, well, you know, that goes back to the, uh, the planning side of thing. things. Uh, you want to, you know, if you, if you are working, you want to be able to make sure that you're, you know, saving some, putting some aside because, you know, you, you want to be able to keep a job for as long as you can, mm -hmm. but you also need to be realistic in understanding, you know, if something happens, you need to have, you know, what they call, what I, what I typically call a, r a rainy day fund, you know, emergency planning. Yeah. Uh, so, so always make sure that you're, you know, setting something aside, you know, in that said, you know, things, things may happen. So again, you would, you would come to us and then we would, you know, try to figure out the situation. And if it's something that, you know, that, that you did or something that, you know, that you contributed to, we would certainly address that. Mm -hmm. But a, a lot of it is. Sometimes it's out of their control. It's yeah. what if the employer goes out of business? Right, right. And then, uh, so yeah, there's, there's definitely that, but then the, so you've, you've got to be able to plan for it, yeah. but also it's, it's gotta be a mindset change. Mm. Um, I like that you, you've, you've got, you've got to have, you've got to really have the mindset of, okay, if this is something that you want to do, yeah. then you've got to commit to it. You've got to commit to it and you've got to put your whole heart into it. Yeah. Otherwise you, you might be successful. But you're not going to be as successful as as somebody that you know really put everything they have into it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can't kind of tiptoe the line there, right? You got to jump you, over. You've got you got you've got to go full force. Yeah. So and, and, and again, it's a it's it's a um, it's something that you don't hear of a lot within the uh, disability community because everybody says well you, you get benefits so you shouldn't you shouldn't have to work mm -hmm. so but, but there's a lot of people that that want to work and they and they, they can work mm -hmm. and they should be working yeah so we try to help them you know work yeah. i think it, it it's um if somebody can work i think they enjoy it yeah it gives you know you go home at the end of the day and you feel good about the work that you yeah do. You, you have purpose yeah exactly it gives purpose there um so i think that's a really really big thing and i know it's also <clears throat> a big topic in the state mm -hmm. Um, for that. So thank you right. for doing that. Um, and then <clears throat> we are getting a little bit later here into the stream, so I don't want to go too far. Um, we had Chris Dean, Christopher, uh, he had a question. How can someone with a disability get a job if they don't want a job? I think uh, maybe a little rephrasing there, Chris, or... Um, <clears throat> I think Mr. Whitmeyer. Well, with, with, with our agency, you know, it's, it's going to be consumer control. You know, if you want something or if you desire to, you know, to pursue something, then, you know, we would work towards, you know, work towards that goal. But again, if you, if you want to do something or if you don't want to do something, you know, it's, it's ultimately your choice. Yeah. I would say, um, you know, you have to make that decision, Chris. And when you're a hundred percent on the decision, then you would give right. You know, a call. Um, I wanted to see if there were any upcoming. We we talked in May that the Advocacy and Action Academy will will start taking place in some um, in group settings. But are there some upcoming events that you would like to highlight through DRR? Yeah. Um, next Tuesday, we're going to be uh, uh, putting uh, going down to Montgomery and. Pursuing our Independent Living Advocacy Day, which I mean, advocacy as we've talked about is is a big deal. And when and when you're going down to the uh, to the state house and the you know the state congress and talking to the legislators, you're really hitting the uh, the systems advocacy part of it. So that we're, we we our agency is, uh, along with um, you know other groups uh, that we uh, that we work uh, closely with are all going to be going down there on Tuesday. And Who do you guys have lined up to speak with? Um, it, it, that's that's a that's a real fluid uh, question because I mean uh, you know we have um, we have some senators and some congressmen involved, uh, but then we have uh, some uh, local community members that are going to be uh, you know highlighted. You know, so it it really um, I want I want to. Um, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag just yet. Yeah, no, that's okay. So yeah, um, maybe we'll do another one easy. You can tell me about it. Right, right. But then on the uh, let's see. On April seventeenth, uh, that's gonna we have we're gonna have our uh, employment network. Uh, each each month, we try to do a uh, session on the employment network, where it's uh, it's kind of just sort of orientation 
uh, uh, you know, this is what it is. This is what it is. You know, so uh, April 17th is going to be that. Yeah. But then there's the, the big event that we do every year. It's the uh, Magic City Chocolate Challenge. I saw that on the Facebook page, but I, I didn't go too deep into it. So yeah. if you would speak about that. Yeah. So that is our annual fundraiser. And this year, I think th- we, this is our fifth year of doing it. So, you know, this year it's going to be at Regents Park. Okay. Uh, which, which is the ball field downtown, which yeah. is, you know, it's, it's an amazing place to hold. It's to hold a really cool spot. Yeah. So basically it's a, um, we, we, we uh, bring in uh, different chefs that, that uh, make chocolate dishes. And then we, um, you know, you, you can test it. Hopefully you don't make yourself sick. Yeah, it's eat gonna too be, much chocolate. Because, it, because it's going to be a lot of chocolate. Uh, so you have to be careful with that. Yeah. But it's, um, it's really a good event towards, uh, you know, Learning, learning about, of course, different different chocolates, and learn, learning about who we are, and then uh, basically just, it's just an environment to just kind of sort of come in, let your hair down. There's, uh, there's going to be a silent auction. There's going to be, of course, it's re- Regents Field, so they'll, so they'll have the, uh, they should have the ballpark open. I'm not sure on that. Yeah. Hopefully they will. Cause, uh, Is it yeah. going to be going on during a live game? They're not going to be a live game. I, I don't. I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think so. But that's going to be. Uh, let's see. Uh, um, uh, April thirtieth. April thirtieth. Yeah. This month. It's uh, five thirty to eight at Regents Field. I'd like to come. Yeah. And so, so what you could do is um, there. There's. There's a couple of ways to uh, to get tickets. Yeah. Uh, you can either uh, go on our um, website. Uh, drradvocates.org and then there's a little button it says magic city chocolate challenge and then you can click you can click on that and then you can order tickets that way or you can call our agency which is uh 205-251-2223 and then uh, we can hook you up with tickets that way yeah um, do you have to order them? Because I'm a little bit of a procrastinator. Can I order them like the day before? Yeah, or, it's well, just like an e-ticket. Yeah, once I order. Yeah, well, you can get them at the day, at the door too. Oh, you can. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, uh, but yeah, no, there's there's lots of different ways to get them. Yeah, that uh, I imagine it's pretty big turnout at that facility, and everybody loves chocolate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. You <laughs> so, can't say no to dessert. No, yeah, no, you tough. can't. So, but it, and like I said, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a lot of. It's a live variety, but it's it's a really fun event. So where you're you're just kind of sort of is is like I said, it's a way to kind of sort of chill out and yeah. really just uh, enjoy the environment. And it's I'm, I'm happy it's in April because it being outside, it's not too hot yet. Yeah, you know, it's kind of getting to that point where it's getting a little sticky, but it's still pretty cool mm-hmm. because it, it, we used to have it in June. And, and yeah, it was. You had to be inside at that it point. Was, it was brutal. If yeah, you, if you were not inside. I mean, you're eating chocolate. Plus, it's June in Alabama, yeah. sweating face. And yeah. So, so we tried it. We tried. Tried it. We're gonna try it a little bit earlier this year. So again, uh, June thirtieth, uh, five thirty at eight. And then, uh, yeah, just uh, come out and support us. I want some uh, chocolate-covered strawberries. Do you guys do, they do stuff like that? Well, you just have to come and see. I got, I got real, dude. I you're got just going to have to come and see. <laughs> Very good. Um, well, I do want to say um, to everybody watching and watching in the future, I would definitely recommend, and I'm going to pull it up here, um, go to Facebook and follow DRR's Facebook page. And I'm going to load that up so you guys can see the icon and what to search. Let me go to Facebook. And then I'm also going to pull up the DRRadvocates.org so everybody can see. You know how sometimes you go to look for something and you're like, I'm not sure if that's the right icon or the right Right. page or I might have misspelled it wrong. Right. So I want to make sure that they see. Um, so for the Facebook page, it's DRR Advocates. Yeah, I was on it earlier, but there it is: Disability Rights and Resources. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that up, so you guys can see it. And I would highly recommend <clears throat> after this going over and following, joining the page, and keeping up. As you can see, um, you know, post pretty much every day, or at least every week. Uh, very active on Facebook, so I would recommend doing that. And then also, drradvocates.org. You can see that there. Let me pull this down so you can see that. <clears throat> and here you can see uh, their website. Very interactive. Uh, and 
you can see the Magic City Chocolate Challenge right here on the right where you can buy tickets. So very cool. Now, uh, as we come to a close, I'm going to ask, is there anything that we haven't talked about um, that you would like to say to the community? Well, yes, I think there, uh, there's a something that I would like to end on. Mm-hmm. Basically, just the idea of, you know, the, the idea of perception and what that means. That means different things to different people. But for for individuals that have, uh, you know, challenges and disabilities, the perception is that, you know, they people think that they don't necessarily or they may not necessarily amount to much. They may not be able to do this or that, you know, and that's that's total that's totally false because, yes, you know, I, I might do something differently, but I still get it done. Mm-hmm. So just because somebody's in it here or just because just because somebody is, you um, know, maybe blind or deaf or, you know, they have may, may have a communication device. Don't count them out. Don't don't say don't don't just say that, you know, they're they're different, so I don't want to include them. Um, because you're not you're you're doing the yourself, you're doing them, and they're you're doing the community a huge disservice when you're when you're exclu- excluding an entire population of really, really um, you know, pa- passionate and um and contributing members of society. So just basically, when when you're when you're thinking about employment, when you're thinking about you know posting jobs, or when you're thinking about you know having events, you know think about making sure that you know whatever you're posting or whatever you're whatever you're doing, make sure that it's inclusive. Mm. So because you want to uh, you don't want to you don't want to turn anybody away. Mm-hmm. I think that's really important and. I feel like a lot, some of that might come into awareness too. Right. People just normally, if if um, you don't have somebody with a direct experience close by, you might not be open to that mm-hmm. because you haven't thought about that. But you know, being open to that um, and being aware of that, yeah. I think is a yeah. big thing. Just just being just being just being willing to uh, you know take a chance on somebody. Yeah. So that, that that's that's really the the greatest thing that I can say right now. Um, we had an opportunity to speak with um, the owner of Tzatziki's Mediterranean restaurant mm-hmm. uh, a couple months ago, and he said that uh, in about half of his stores, he employs two people with a disability. Mm-hmm. And the culture in those stores is just widely more family than corporate right. as opposed to the other ones. And it's amazing what you know being an inclusive community uh, does for everybody. Right, yeah, because like I said, you're... you're um you know, you, you're including individuals that yes, they might they might do things differently, but they can they can still contribute. They can still do you know just as many things as anybody else. They just might do it a little bit differently. Yeah. And you just uh, it just helps to be open to that. Yeah. Don't judge me on how I do the job. Judge me on a job well done. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Nailed it. All right. Very good. <clears throat> I am going to cruise through and see if anybody has any closing questions here. Uh, and I don't see any at this point. So at this point, uh, I would like to thank you for being uh, here with me today and with Alabama Care. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody for watching right now and watching in the future. And uh, we will see you next week. I will go ahead and stop the stream and stop the recording.